hi everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for another uh, webinar in OGEN's uh, series of webinars on interesting legal topics. It's really wonderful to have people join us. I can see that there are folks from uh, around uh, uh, quite a number of places, which is wonderful. Um, my name is Nat Paul. I am OGEN's Director of Educator Support. Uh, and I am joined uh, as always by my partner in crime, Christy Pagnuti, who is running things behind the scenes. Um, I will be uh, introducing our guest speaker very shortly. Um, <clears throat> before I do that, um, <clears throat> I wanna just again say thanks to everybody from jo for joining from all over the place. We really you know, cannot emphasize enough how much we appreciate the work that teachers are doing right now and that you're willing to take some time out to, to spend it with us and to uh, learn about something new is really, really gratifying and wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, we'll begin as we typically do uh, by, uh, with a land acknowledgement. Um, so uh, we come to be here today, of course, as a result of contact between nations, uh, the indigenous people of Turtle Island and the colonial power that would settle into this geopolitical thing called Canada. Um, I am speaking in Toronto, which is of course the traditional uh, territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron Indigenous peoples. Um, while history is important, uh, we also need to acknowledge that Toronto, like many, many places, actually remains home to numerous and diverse Indigenous communities. I can see that we have people from uh, many parts of Ontario here. Um, and when we think about land and place, uh, I remember that we do so to insist that they remain as visible in this relationship uh, as the communities and the land and as Canada ultimately does itself. Um, finally, uh, we underscore the fact that European colonialism is of course not at all limited to Canada. Uh, as we go further, we're going to be hearing about child soldiers and atrocities committed in Central Africa. Uh, and we do this, we should keep in mind that it's that same colonialism, which is proudly or profoundly linked to the same kind of brutality and political instability everywhere it goes. Um, so folks in the teaching community may remember uh, some years ago, a big uh, sort of social media phenomenon around Joseph Kony and the Kony 2012 movement, which was of course a film and some teaching uh, materials that were related to it very popular on Facebook. It really, it really grew exponentially. Um, Kony, of course, was the leader uh, of a militia and guerrilla group called the Lord's Resistance Army, which has for a long time been associated with violence and war crimes. We're not talking about Kony today, but rather uh, one of his commanders, a man named Don Dominic Ongwen, who's been recently tried uh, and convicted at the International Criminal Court. And we are so, so lucky to have our speaker with us. Um, we have Dr. Ayo Akinroye, who is a tribunal member and immigration judge with the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. But prior to this, uh, he, was, uh, he gave testimony in this case. He's a postdoctoral fellow in digital justice at the Centre for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto, uh, where his research is about the use of video conferencing technologies in Canadian criminal courts and how these uses clash with the charter rights of accused persons. Now they can also challenge the cultural assumptions about how the role of the judge is performed and the image of what a judge should be. Uh, in fall of 2017, Dr. Akinroye was a visiting professional with the prosecution division of the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, where he provided subject matter expertise in the prosecution of Dominic Ongwen, who was a child soldier uh, previously for 70 counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes alleged to have been committed after uh, the 1st of July, 2002 in Northern Uganda. Uh, he is also uh, <laughs> the, the proud holder of a doctorate from international criminal law from McGill University. Um, less from me, I think now, and, and more from you, Ayo. Uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nat, thank you, Nat. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen. Um, so that um, people can see my screen. Okay. Um, please, can you see my screen? Can you confirm you can see my screen? Okay, thank you. Second, let me do some tech things there. Okay, so um, I would like to thank um, the audience team, um, including Matt Paul and Christy. Pregnancy for inviting me to make uh, this presentation. Um, 
it's interesting because, and it's also um, a little bit saddening, but the trial of um, Dominic Owen is, is a complicated one and it does evoke uh, different emotions um, from different consequences uh, in the international justice sector, um, even in his own country, Uganda, and in northern Uganda, where um, there has been a decade of several years of conflict. Um, in terms of my unique expertise here, yeah, I did provide subject matter expertise um, for the prosecution team at the International Criminal Court um, in navigating this complex identity to our status um, as both a victim and as a perpetrator. As I don't see in the course of my presentation today, this trial did push international justice um, into the gray area. And again, sadly, the, the law doesn't really do well with, with gray. We, we like things in, uh, in black and white. The law is usually built in black and white and there's no in between. But sadly, even in our highly complicated world and in the battlefields where Thai soldiers are uh, used to commit heinous crimes, um, things are not always simple. Um, the debate around Dominic Owen and trial and eventual conviction by the International Criminal Court um, centered on the question of um, a child's agency, that is their capacity to act uh, based on their will and when it starts and when it stops. So for me, um, I've been involved with OGEN for quite a number of years now, and it's heartwarming for me to know that OGEN has a mock trial um, on their website on the recruitment of so so child soldiers, um, the Prosecutor versus Marvel, uh, which is a very good practical guide, um, and I highly recommend it to high school educators, um, introducing your student um, to the dynamics of um, um, child soldiers in international law. And in, if at any point in time you need assistance with the mock trial, uh, please you can link up with myself and OGEN team, and I can provide more support and uh, in assistance in introducing your high school student um, to those. In terms of our roadmap today, um, what are we going to discuss about? Uh, I'm going to pre provide a brief um, background on who Dominic Owen, and then I'm going to provide a high level summary on international laws as it's applicable to his case, and then I will discuss his indictment um, at the International Criminal Court. Then I will touch briefly on some of his, the complexity involved in his trial. And then I will provide a very brief recap of the over 1,077 pages, a page of judgment rather, and then over by the trial chambers of the International Criminal Court. And then I will critically discuss some of the uh, issues emerging from that judgment. And then I will provide my thoughts, conclude with my thoughts on the sources of the judgment, as well as the failure or the sources of international criminal justice generally. Uh, what I call the perplexity uh, and anxiety of international uh, criminal justice. I will talk briefly about that. And then I will open up to um, uh, Q and A. So, uh, who, is, who is Dominic Owen? Dominic, 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 Dominic. We have been hearing of Dominic for the last almost more than a decade now. So, who is he? Um, Dominic Owen is a former Thai soldier and a former senior commander of the rebel group um, called the Lord Resistance Army in, in, in Uganda. Um, it's interesting, or not even interesting, we have to really note this, that Dominic was adopted um, by the LRA uh, at the age of nine. Um, I want us to contextualize it. That is at the, a grade four um, child that was going to a school and he was adopted. Dominic is known or was known as one of the most ruthless commander of the Lord Resistance Army, which I will be calling as for um, LRA. And again, Dominic was reported to be in charge of a group um, that attacked the rumor, um, killing many people as they celebrated um, um, Christmas. Dominic quickly rose in the leadership to become the second in command to the leader of um, LRA, which is just like one. And I know that. Some of us, or most of us, should have heard of Joseph Kony, Kony, Kony. There was a 2012 campaign uh, regarding um, Joseph Kony um, trying to capture him and hand him over to the International Criminal Court for accountability purposes. But before Dominic became or uh, emerged as a trusted and a senior member of uh, the LRA, Dominic was trained as a child soldier to fight against the government of Northern Uganda, of Uganda rather. And he was forced to kill, to mutilate, 
and pollute from and rape civilians. Again, um, testimonial evidence that was presented um, before the ICC and also in documented in several scholarly work um, revealed that even at 8, 8 15, before 15 or around 8 15, Dominic was exposed to and allegedly forced to participate in the massacre over, of over 300 people in the village of Antia, which was masterminded by Dominic's mentor in the, the LRA um, by a person called uh, Vincent Oche. We do know that in February, Dominic was convicted of 61 counts and from the 70 counts that was David of war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, which is allegedly committed against civilian population um, um, in camps for internal displaced persons uh, in Northern Uganda. The other thing, and this is why so many um, people are interested uh, in Dominic's situation and um, complex reality is the fact that he is the first person um, to be tried and to be convicted at the ICC for crime, which include those which he was also a, with, of, of also a victim, that is forced conscription or uh, an enlisting of children under 15 into armed forces. The second question we need to know as I go forward in this presentation is who is the LRA? Um, there, you know, I'm going to provide a brief summary of who the LRA is. Um, the LRA is an armed rebel group, which, um, I, like I said before, was led by Joseph Foley, and it was organized um, around 1907. And it initially fought the, the Uganda government in northern Uganda with incursions into South um, Sudan and Sudan, then Sudan. Um, the LRA, over the course of their 30 years in existence, or more than 30 years in existence now, um, they wage war across five uh, countries in East and Central Africa for nearly 30 years. And they were notorious. That group was notorious for chopping up limbs so, as punishment, as well as kidnapping and raping young girls. Here is the thing that also we need to pay attention to, which will come um, into play as I go along in my um, presentation today, is that the LRA family believes that they are back by the Holy Spirit. Um, they have this Christian um, leanings uh, and that they are backed by the Holy Spirit to wage uh, war against the government of Uganda and that they have the protection of the Holy Spirit and that they are not under the law. And also there's also this kind of mysticism around evil spirit, which was used as a star tactic to control abductees and followers of the LRA and also to keep them in compliance while they are in captivity. You know that most of the people attending here are high school educators and you teach um, grade 12 international law. So the question that's coming to your mind is what has international laws to do and got to do with uh, Dominic Cromwell? Um, so if we remember our international law, international law is a set of rules and customs that governs the relationship between countries known as states. Um, countries recognized as states have certain rights and responsibility defined by international law and custom. Take for instance, they have the right to sovereignty, uh, meaning that uh, the state has exclusive power of jurisdiction over its territory and population. And this right, this power can only be legally interfered with when certain requirements of international law are met. Um, also, states also have the right to be free from intervention in their domestic affairs. And that means that other states should not intervene in the legal or political um, decision made by another state. Um, however, this does not mean that states cannot try to influence other states. They do influence other states, as you know, <laughs> when we talk about the, the, the country of America with international law, um, to sanctions, um, embargo, um, soft policies, and also aid, where they restrict aid, they refuse to give aid to some countries unless they comply with some of these other things. So states do do that. State also in international law do have certain responsibilities, uh, which include the duty to fulfill their international obligation in good faith and to respect international human rights law. So why public international law um, is primarily concerned with the right and obligation of states and international organization, international criminal law is an exception. It's concerned with the rules and principles applying to individuals for committing international crimes, individuals such as Dominic so briefly, a little bit here, is the fact that the definition of international crime remains debated to today, but it's generally understood as an act that violates the fundamental interest of the international community and entails international, uh, rather entails individual 
from our responsibility. So specific crimes that are part of individual responsibility as international law includes piracy, um, slavery, genocide, um, aggression, crimes against humanity, war crimes, such as slavery, et cetera, et cetera. So the current system of international criminal law work through international act of tribunal, um, such as the former inter international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, or the one for Rwanda, or even in terms of mixed or hybrid tribunals, such as the one in uh, Cambodia, or the special court for special court for the Sierra Leone, or the one currently in uh, Kosovo in the Hague. And also we have the International Criminal Court, and also it works through national courts. Um, one of the legal consequences of framing an act as an international crime is that it gives rise to what is called universal jurisdiction. I will touch briefly on that. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but what it means, universal jurisdiction means that any state, including Canada, Germany, uh, Belgium, any state, um, they are allowed to try alleged perpetrators of international crimes, even in the absence of any direct link between the accused and the state exercising jurisdiction. So let's contextualize a little bit. In Canada today, Canada can decide to prosecute um, anyone um, that committed heinous crime overseas, maybe in Syria or in Rwanda or where in Yemen or Afghanistan under the principle of uh, universal jurisdiction. And certain countries have already exercised that principle. I think Belgium has done that in the past. Germany is currently doing that. The Netherlands has done that and so on and so forth. The International Criminal Court is a force permanent Fifty beings in international court, criminal court, established to bring justice um, to the perpetrators of the most um, serious war crimes and innocent. Um, the international criminal court is established under the Rome Statute, um, a treaty um, that came into force in 2002, and as of today has been signed on to by 124 countries, which, like if I use the legal law, international law legalese, it has been ratified uh, by 124 countries. Um, unlike the tribunals for Rwanda and for former Yugoslavia, which were established by the United Nations Secretary, uh, Security Council and, and only prosecute crimes committed during specific um, conflict, the ICC, as we all know, is a permanent court of criminal jurisdiction that is independent from the UN. And the ICC only tries cases that have not been investigated or prosecuted by a national judicial system. I need to say this because, again, when we study the ICC, we get this idea that the ICC is the court of first resort. No, the ICC is the court of last resort. If there's a conflict, say, for instance, in Nigeria or a conflict in Syria, it's expected that uh, where international crimes were com committed, it's expected that that country will first be the one to try those cases. It is when they are unwilling or unable to try those cases of those uh, alleged perpetrators that the International Criminal Court uh, will step in. So here's the thing. Like I said before, the International Criminal Court came into existence in 2002. Um, when they came into existence immediately, uh, five African countries immediately referred their situations in their country to the court. Uganda was one of them. So in December 2003, Uganda referred the situation of the Lord Resistance Army LRA to the ICC. You know, the, the government of Uganda has been dealing with the LRA for years. The conflict battling, they've offered amnesty program, they've done so many things just to quell the LRA and they're killed. So when the International Criminal Court was established, they felt, oh, this is the right way um, to go about um, to, to solve our problem. Again, in the course of KA, I may talk about the polarity that happens between uh, why ICC is focusing on LRA and not the and not the government of Uganda, but that's not what I'm focusing on right now. And so, in 2004, the um, the ICC prosecutor then, uh, Nusso Campo, announced that the ICC was opening an investigation uh, into the situation in northern Uganda. So let's move a year after. In 2005, the ICC issued um, sealed arrest warrant for war crimes and crimes against humanity um, for the LRA top five leaders. So we have the four, top five leaders are Jesse Kony, Vincent Oti, Okot Odiambo, Rastan Lukiya, and Dominic Owen. The, the warrant were unsealed in October 2005. And it's very important to know five LRA leaders. Luki 
Otia was killed in 2006. Oti was killed in 2007. Um, Odiambo's body was found in the Central African Republic um, in early 2015. So the only two leaders of the LRA that had an indictment, uh, you know, they were being indicted or were issued against um, is um, Joseph Pony and Dominic Omwen. And Dominic was surrendered into custody, which I will get to um, later on. So um, around the January 6, 2015, um, Dominic was um, captured um, when he broke rank with him. Um, um, Joseph Pony and was transferred into ICC custody. Um, then in January of 26, 2015, Dominic made his first appearance before the third chamber two of the ICC. See today, Pony remains at large. Um, I don't know if some of uh, some of you are familiar with Joseph Pony campaign of 2012. Um, that was that was a failure. Um, and also, you, you, some of you also should be aware that uh, the US, the United States still have a bounty, I think almost $5 million bounty on the head of any, on Joseph Pony to, to be given to anyone that's, uh, that could help them to capture um, Joseph Pony. And today, his fighters remain a threat to civilian in the border region between Central African Republic, uh, South Sudan, um, Sudan, and Northeastern Congo. So let, let's move away from what international law has got to do with it, which I've quickly explained in some high level summary in broad stroke. Um, we look at the dual identity of Dominic Owen, victim and perpetrator, or perpetrator, victim and perpetrator, victim, or whatever way you want to put it. The crime of Dominic evoke different emotions um, since he has been indicted, since he has been surrendered um, to the ICC. There's been a huge public debate regarding his dual identity, both a victim and as a perpetrator. And incredibly, incredibly good um, scholarship has explored his, um, his dual identity. Some Ugandans, he believes that Dominic Owen is, was, is being made a scapegoat and they have called for forgiveness. Others in Uganda um, insist that he is a perpetrator and must be paid accountable um, for the heinous crime that he committed. Um, Despite the judgment of the ICC, which convicted him and which has been held by some victims as a victory for international criminal justice, and which I will get into the analysis in, in a moment, uh, there's that need to broaden the discussion um, beyond simple dichotomies of uh, perpetrator or victim that um, uh, Dominic has been framed over the years. Uh, the reality of, of Dominic's action and the context in which they occur. It's much more complex than whether it's guilty or innocent. Yes, it's guilty now as found by the International Criminal Court, but that doesn't change the dynamics that is more complex and than that. And, and it's also uh, 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 and it also reflects um, the reality of all that children who were prosecuted illegally. And that is the reality we have to engage uh, with. Again, I put it in candidate terms, a grade four child that was going to school in early money, or let's say winter money, that was kidnapped by a rude norm and constricted um, and indoctrinated and all those things. And that's the reality in different conflict um, zones all over the world. So also, this same um, Dominic Owen case also um, is also tempting for us to, uh, to provide the types of that phenomenon in different um, conflict zones uh, by declaring that children that are associated with um, armed groups like LRA, um, are innocent under international law, or they are innocent um, by, by, by whatever rubric or metrics you want to use. That also is not totally correct. Um, some of them are not actually victims. Um, some of them, data and researchers reflect, assume that some of them actually voluntarily um, join the rebel group to wage war or to gain protection as a way of survivor. So the agent, the genetic role is not minimized. So actually, they play. Typogetic role in finding um, the rebels. Um, but others like Dominic Owen might be adopted and forced into becoming warlords and villains. So let's move away from that dual um, identity, which I'll go to later in my analysis. But for now, let's focus on um, the indictment and trial. Um, in 2005, um, like I said, the ICC issued um, the first um, arrest warrant against the um, five um, senior LRA members. 
um, and then in 2015, he, he, he appeared uh, before the prefer chamber of the ICC when he was when he was captured and surrendered to the ICC. And at that during his prefer chambers, um, he, he confirmed that he was an LRA commander. And he said he was adopted by the age of uh, 14 in 1990. But the judgment that just came from the ICC has reflected that that wasn't correct. He was adopted at the age of nine or is it nine or ten? Again, based on the testimony provided by his uncle um, that came there. So, like I said before, we all know he was charged with 17 counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes, which included murder, enslavement, um, inflicting serious body, bodily injury, and suffering, correct treatment. There are so many. Um, particularly, uh, alleged to have been committed mainly in the IDP camps of um, Lukodi, Pajule, Bodet, and uh, Abok between 2003 and 2004. Uh, he was also charged, this is also important to say, he was also charged with sexual and gender based uh, crimes and the conscription of and use of Thai soldiers alleged to have taken place again over the period of 2002 and 2005 um, in the IDP. Um, in the IDP. Again, in terms of indictment, it was alleged to have committed its crimes directly and indirectly to LRA troops in the senior brigade under his command. So he was commanding a troop called um, Trick Senior Brigade, and he was also charged um, with forced marriage as an international um, crime. So let's quickly go to the prefer chamber's findings at that time. So on January 21st, uh, 2016, um, the Petroleum Chamber 2 had a hearing um, to determine whether there, are su there was sufficient evidence to send the case against the Owen to trial. Um, the ICC prosecutor alleged that Owen is responsible for war crimes, like I said, between that 2002 and 2005 um, framework. Uh, and the ICC prosecutor presented evidence to support that case, and the defense challenged the admissibility of some of the evidence the prosecutor uh, presented. I would be in broad stroke. Um, some of the arguments provided and you know, presented by the defense, uh, that is Dominic Owen's lawyers, um, regarding um, the fact that they should dismiss the charges um, against him. Um, so, number one, first, they argued that because Dominic Owen did not leave the LRA until 2015 at the age of 30, uh, he was deconsidered a child soldier until that time and therefore cannot be um, prosecuted. So, that is a continuum argument that he was charged from. Um, was adopted from age nine to age 30, and he never left the uh, LRA. Therefore, the he, 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 should, he should get the protection of international law that this was a child soldier. I, 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 and in this regard, they did argue, that is, Dominic own lawyers argued that child, child soldiers are psychologically broken down, and they are desensitized, they are dehumanized, and disconnected from the social construct of a normal society um, in Northern Uganda. Second, the defense also argued that um, Dominic responsibility should be excluded on the ground that he acted under duress uh, within the meaning of Article 31 1D of the Rome Statute. And that defense under Article 31 uh, 1D of Rome Statute is extremely um, narrow and is only available um, if the accused, say, for instance, Dominic committed a crime under duress resulting from a threat of imminent death or continue or imminent serious bodily uh, injury against their person or another person. And that accused acts or acted necessarily and reasonably to avoid distress, provided that the person or the accused person caused greater harm than the one sought to be avoided. So those were some of the arguments that the defense um, counsel for Dominic raised. The pre-trial, when they were making issue that decision whether to permit um, Dominic for trial or not, they argued that the threat alleged by the defense that the possibility that Dominic Owen will be later subjected to display measures and not be imminent. Um, in this regard, the has emphasized that duress is not regulated in the Rome Statute in a way that will provide blanket immunity to members of criminal organizations such as the LRA, which, which have brutal system of ensuring discipline as soon as they can establish that their membership was not uh, voluntary. So the, again, the um, preferred team has also argued that Dominic State within the LRA, um, which the 
David Hitler argued uh, is a source of the threat um, could not have been said to be beyond his control. So for this, um, the Ricard members argued or pointed to evidence that um, there are several people or several people that uh, escaped from their larry and that Dominic could have also escaped, um, but he chose not to escape and uh, he chose to rise uh, within the hierarchy of uh, LRA, exposing it, therefore exposing himself um, to an increasing level of responsibility within the organization. And finally, um, the Pritchard members argued that um, Dominic failed to demonstrate, um, or the defense rather failed to demonstrate that Dominic acted necessarily and reasonably to avoid the alleged threat and that he had not intended to cause a greater harm than the one sought to be avoided. So, so for instance, one of the things that the Petra Chamber said was Dominic could have avoided accepting false uh, wives when they gave him wife and found out wife to him um, by the leadership, he did accept them. Uh, and then he could have also avoided raping them or at the least, according to the Petra Chamber, that it could have reduced the brutality of the sexual assault or the sexual abuse that he committed against those uh, false wives. So as a result, um, as a result, Dominic was committed for trial. So let's quickly go and discuss some of the complexities um, in his trial. I want us to understand something here or note something here that in every international um, trial, criminal trial, uh, is a contest between completing narrative, um, which is vigorously completed, constructed rather um, by the defense and the prosecution, also by the prosecution and by the defense between um, constructing histories and, uh, and about the moral or political judgment made by actors such as Dominic Owen and the LRA leaders or whatever, uh, or the types of that abducted in those history on those situations. So during Dominic um, trial, he was actually presented in a logic of extremes um, for the prosecution. He was portrayed as a murderer, um, as a rapist, you know, um, he was framed as a fearless terrorist. And, as the senior commander of the LRA, who was powerful, who was proud, and who was apparently just gratifying his desires in the in the bush and fully responsible for the uh, for the crimes he started, and that was the way he was spread throughout um, the entire entire of the trial. And for the defense, like I said, in terms of the argument, he was just framed as a child soldier, a soldier that was abducted. Someone that was victimized, that was, was orphaned, in, orphaned, that was in prison, in, 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 initiated, indoctrinated, and then incorporated into the LRA. And again, they brought this serious critical uh, cosmology, which is the fact that he was head spell banned um, by the spirit um, called upon by the LRA um, headsman, Joseph Coney, with his suicidal uh, tendency. And don't forget, uh, we shouldn't forget that the the, the framing of the defense was mental, uh, mental, uh, mental um, defect and duress. So they had to paint him as a madman. So in terms of what one of the things they did was to the child soldier, therefore it shouldn't be prosecuted um, under international law, it shouldn't be prosecuted uh, by the ICC. Um, and like you said, he's the only former child abductee to face charges before the ICC. And during the history of LRA, um, it, according to estimates, LRA has adopted at least 30,000 um, children to Israel, in large part because they are easier to manipulate than um, and through my control um, tactics and methods that instill uh, fear and sheer brutality. Um, the LRA has been able to initiate these children and force them to undergo uh, what they called military training. And children are often forced to kill adults or other children who fail to um, obey their lives people or who try to escape. Um, testimonial uh, evidence or, uh, uh, conducted by researchers actually view of uh, a particular um, type, a former child soldier that was forced to kill his parents, both parents, and he killed them and before he was taken away. And you can imagine the kind of emotional strain, emotional trauma that that person um, uh, has faced. Um, the ICC uh, status, the um, Rome status, uh, actually includes the construction and use of child soldiers as a war crime. 
um, the statute does not provide um, jurisdiction over crime committed by someone under 18. Um, but Dominic, in this case, was tried uh, for crime um, he allegedly committed as an adult over 18. And um, the issue now becomes a complexity. He was adopted at nine years old, and the um, um, and the brutality that he might have experienced uh, in the hands of the military was the front burner during the trial. Um, the point was, to, how can you um, ignore his victimhood from nine to eighteen, and then focus on his perpetrator status from eighteen to nineteen? He's not a robot. It's a continual. The indoctrination was from that age uh, to that. Um, and the two salient issues that I said um, I, I play during the trial was his role as a child abductee and child soldiers in the LRA um, negated his responsibility for crime or any crime that allegedly committed. And also whether um, the crimes he committed as a result of duress or because he had mental defect then negated his responsibility for those crimes. Let me quickly talk in broad stroke, talk about the doctrine of responsibility in international law. Um, and the underlying assumption of it is the fact that agents like um, Dominic Owen is free, um, completely did without restraint or compulsion, knowingly and deliberately. And that was why the trial, the charges against uh, and trial of Dominic Owen um, the ICC focused on his individual criminal responsibility, um, which is different, distinct from that of his commander, which was Cronin. But the problem we have is that when you're trying to have a good responsibility for crime um, in situations um, in which the actions normally known to be uh, a crime uh, are committed uh, by agents whose freedom to act or to control the actions whose capacity to make fully informed and reasoned decisions are very problematic and debatable. That is the case with Dominic Owen. So the reality is that I suggest and the context in which they live or they usually operate, op 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 operate present, present a challenge to conceptualizing responsibility with a number of factors that can separately each be seen to diminish um, individual responsibility. So take for instance, one of the things that is a, that could diminish responsibility is the concept of coercion, uh, which is no majority of child soldiers do not intend to wage war. They were coerced into waging war when they were in LRA custody. And that should diminish or absorb personal um, responsibility for action uh, if a reasonable person um, COVID seems to see no other alternative to committing the act, criminal act, uh, when faced with a serious and credible threat. And like I said before, that has been the argument. Dominic Onwell was abducted, was indoctrinated, was forced. He cannot be personally responsible for all the inner crime he committed when he was turned from an angel to a demon. And that's what the, the French Council and the ICC ran through or all, all the past. Let's focus on that pill part, which is mental defect. So like I said, the argument is that he has mental disease or different during the period which he was alleged um, to commit a crime. So the argument is that from age nine to age 30, um, he, was, um, he, was, uh, he, he had mental um, defect or in the worst, he was under duress throughout um, the um, period of time frame. So during the trial, um, a psychiatric for the defense, the defense called a psychiatric, and actually the psychiatric testified that Dominic Owen had had two types of mental illness and that he did not pretend to have mental illness um, during multiple interviews when they went to assess him. Um, the prosecution apparently would have to challenge that testimony or that evidence and uh, went to call down psych psychologists and it, it, the, 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 the prosecution psychologist um, psychologists rather did not agree with the conclusion of the defense um, uh, mental health expert um, that Dominic had uh, a mental disorder. The psycho psychologist do admitted that Dominic um, suffered some trauma, um, but that does not mean that he automatically means that he has or he had mental um, disorder. So that's second one. And then the third 
complexity that comes about uh, is the aspect of spirituality, which is a serious one that uh, international law has not totally been able to engage with um, in a very serious manner. And again, like Nat was talking, uh, was saying um, in the beginning, um, we talk about the impact of colonialism and the way we frame some ideas that seems foreign um, to Western legal thoughts or Western legal traditions, and how we integrate it in, into uh, explaining aberrant um, behavior. But I want to say something here that spirituality claims has been raised in the past um, in international criminal trials and um, addressed in why determining individual criminal responsibility. But Dominic Owen case um, tries unique because spiritual cosmology occupies the most prominent history uh, in the world of international criminal justice. They encounter spiritual cosmology right from the day they, the boys or the girls were adopted. For instance, so let me contextualize it here for us to understand further. Uh, new adoptees of the LRA um, they have to go through an initiation and uh, um, spiritual rituals where they are forced to kill. Men inflict um, violence on a friend or a family member, and fellow abductees who are tempted to, uh, to flee are just to prove their loyalty to him. So, in the process, they actually testified or gave opinion when they interviewed by researchers that they become desensitized to atrocities and they tend to normalize. Um, LRA's violent um, politics. If you don't go through the initiation process or the ritual, the penalties are that you are either raped, mutilated, or killed. And testimonial evidence abound that shows that many adoptees um, who did not comply with such orders were actually killed, and those kids saw it. Um, and again, the essence of the initiation process or the spiritual ritual um, is to perpetrate fear among the adoptee. And now don't forget we are talking about this idea of um, the agent, the agent is free. Um, he can act on his own behalf or, or, or make rational decisions. Uh, but that from the testimony evidence available um, is not true. That the ritual, the spiritual rituals that they have to go through uh, is meant to re reinforce the importance of obedience or the die. And then testimony evidence also reveals that after Kids have gone through the education process. Um, they be sometimes said they 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 they, they, they see non-violence, committing crimes, um, innocent crimes in particular, as the normal and even arousing um, as they settle into their new environment. So even beyond the initiation process, um, abductees are equally brainwashed by the LRA to support their ideologies. Um, most brainwashing occurs during prayer time um, and it's laced with references to the Holy Spirit by Joseph Coney. And most LRA members actually believe that Joseph Coney was possessed with evil spirit which protected him and enabled him to uh, accurately predict the future. Um, since most new abductees were children, um, Brewatcher was highly effective in the case of Dominic Owen, um, and unwilling agents or uh, unwilling abductees were transformed into eager soldiers, or eager fighters, um, who then believed that every command from Joseph Coney is divinely inspired must be um, immediately obeyed. And also, there's testimony evidence that shows that during the time that Joseph um, Dominic Owen was uh, in the LRA camp, um, he, he was told many times that he was strong. And we also know that he, they said, or the testimony evidence revealed that Coney, the leaders of, uh, uh, of, um, of LRA, uh, actually absorbed these fighters of any crimes that they may have committed or they may have committed as long as they obeyed his orders, uh, which he claimed to come directly from the Holy Spirit. So in the eyes of God, they will be blameless. And by all accounts, all accounts, um, Joseph um, Dominic followed orders and did 
um, as Zell. So let's focus now on the judgment of the HSC. And like I said before, we have a judgment of uh, it was 1,077 page uh, written. Um, so what I'm providing is just a high level summary of it. The judges, three judges of the ITC, 12 pretrial chambers, found them guilty. 61 um, charged uh, counts out of the seven uh, counts that he was charged with. And this range from the war crime of forced conscription of child soldiers to the crime against humanity of forced um, pregnancy, uh, forced um, um, slavery, sexual slavery, and et cetera, and that. But Let's focus on the first one, which is the perpetrator, is a perpetrator. Um, before I go there, let's be, it's very interesting um, that um, the, 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 the decision of the ICC, the pretrial, did not really engage the ball with his victim's cattle. Well, um, I, I, um, I, I, I didn't really engage more with him, but I'll get that in a moment. So Dominic was found guilty as a direct perpetrator, as an indirect co perpetrator for all green and putting in the attack on the IDP, IDP camps in Padule and so on and so forth. The court actually found that Dominic, um, jointly with other ILRA members, demanded soldiers to carry out attacks on the camp. Um, for instance, uh, Dominic with, with his mentor, Mr. Uti, uh, Rasta, Lucria, and other um, LRA leaders ordered um, LRA soldiers to attack the Padule IDP camp, which was one of the central um, theaters where the prosecution really had a very strong uh, case. And that Dominic and his other co leaders have committed, uh, ordered these soldiers to commit crimes, including murder, torture, enslavement, um, outrages upon personal dignity, uh, pillaging, and destruction of civil civilian property. Um, in terms of the sexual and gender based um, crimes that Dominic was charged with um, the pretrial chambers convicted Dominic on all 19 counts of uh, sexual and gender based uh, uh, crimes, um, including forced marriage, torture, rape, slavery, enslavement, forced pregnancy, uh, and outrages upon uh, personal dignity. And the court established that Dominic is criminally responsible for this sexual and gender based violence committed against several women who were adopted. And place in his household as uh, you know as his wife, and he was also resp responsible for such and gender based crime that were that soldiers subordinate to him in his in the brigade that he was commanding, the senior brigade committed against women. Yeah. This particular piece of the conviction, this um, sexual and gender based crime conviction, has been held in the international justice sector even back in Uganda as a major milestone in advancing a you know, progressive uh, jurisprudence on gender justice as a victory for female um, who are victims of this kind of uh, enormous sexual and gender-based um, crime, um, crime and for culpability purposes. In terms of the constituting children under um, age 15, like I said, the judgment, when the, um, I, I listened live to uh, the judgment as was being handed down, the presiding um, judge at the ICC just skipped elements of um, its victimhood or its childhood. Mm, well, you, for the purpose of it, because it really raised, we are going to talk about um, his childhood, his childhood, uh, but we are not concerned about whatever happened when it was between nine and 18. Um, that we're just going to focus on his accountability for 18. So they skip the aspect, the, which is a key part of the first um, theory. Uh, that this is a child soldier. You can't just take a mark and say, it's in the judgment being engaged in meaningful ground or meaningful, meaningful ground regarding those things of it. And Dominic was found uh, liable for the crime of prostituting children under the age of 15 and using them as active combatants and in hostility. Um, again, the court found that the abduction of children and their first prescription into uh, Dominic uh, Brigade, that is a senior um, place portion to uh, what is called a coordinated and a methodological uh, effort on the part of Dominic Owen and the soldiers under um, his um, control himself. 
Now, let's focus now on the key, uh, one of the key theory that the defense, dominated defense was um, articulating, was advancing or advanced right, uh, from the prepared um, um, proceeding to the prior proceeding, which is that of mental defect or duress. The court in the judgment rejected um, the, the two differences of mental defense and duress as raised by um, Dominic Owen's legal uh, team, rather. Um, the court found that the evidence presented did not prove that he had well, mental disease that incapacitated him from appreciating the unlawfulness of the practice. And the court drew reference to a testimony by former LRA fighters who testified with the court before and said that Dominic was a serious soldier who thoroughly uh, planned an attack in, in, in advance. Again, the court also relied heavily on the expert witnesses that were called by the prosecution that indicated that they would have found that Dominic, excuse me, did not have um, did not have any mental disease or disorder. Again, just like the pretrial chambers has found, the court determined that the evidence did not show that Dominic was subjected um, to a threat of imminent death or imminent or continuous serious bodily harm to himself or to another person at the time of this conduct underlining the charge of the crime. Again, the court relied heavily on witness testimony before the court that Dominic was not fully subordinate to Coney and actually on multiple occasions actually acted independently of him in his own and he had you know he had serious issues fall out with um, just according because of making some unilateral decisions. So the court said that he could have made um, with a different decision if he wanted to, which he did on some occasions, but he refused to do it on all occasions. And when the judge, the presiding judge was announcing reading the judgment, um, used the word which I used as the heading title for this uh, presentation that uh, Dominic was not a prophet, but rather he willfully stayed behind in the LRA and advance to the one to become one of his commander. So therefore, the defense of duress does not apply to him. Remember, I've already said that the issue of duress is a very, it's a very narrow term, um, as, which is rightly so, uh, which is the fact that you cannot claim that you are, you are under duress from age nine to 18, and then from under duress again from age 18 to 30. That, uh, that, that is, is almost absolutely uh, an impossibility. Duress cannot be enduring and continuous for that long time. But the issue of mental defect is actually a reality that the court did not really engage in. And that is also a problem with international criminal justice or international justice in particular, because we have little case law on child soldiers that were adopted, former child soldiers that were adopted, um, that were persecuted. Take for instance, where the case law could have been developed, would have been a special court for um, the special court for Syria alone, uh, where several thousands of um, child soldiers were prosecuted and were used to wage war. But when it became the time for trial or for holding them accountable, the prosecutor in special court of Syria alone said that no, I'm not going to go ahead, I'm not going to prosecute um, former child soldiers, I'm not going to go on that route. So we don't have that board of case law that talks about the mental health, uh, the mental uh, um, health impact of activity, of abduction, of indoctrination on former chastised soldiers. And Dominic case will have been the first one if the, if the ICC uh, had meaningfully engaged with it. But sorry, they, they didn't meaningfully engage with that mental health, um, uh, 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 mental health, uh, mental defect argument, but simply believe that it's not possible for someone to, um, for, for him because he exercised some rationality in some cases, but ignoring nine, uh, age nine to 18. And again, I asked again, um, look at it carefully, a great four child being adopted and being forced to kill his parent before he was taken into activity, being forced to eat human flesh and see how this idea that no is, is mentally okay. Um, I think that wasn't a very, um, like I said, the court didn't provide more analysis or more contextual analysis or didn't engage with him. Then now I'm looking forward now to 
What are the critical issues now that uh, Dominic Owe has been convicted at the ICC? One of the, uh, the most important thing that the ICC has to deal with um, is the issue of the appropriate sentence for Dominic Owe. Um, just the fact that um, um, uh, he, he, he was a former child soldier, a former child soldier rather, even though the court did not meaningfully engage with his um, child, uh, with his status as a victim, I say, but really friendly as a perpetrator. On that article 78 of the status, of the own status, um, the trial chambers can con consider the individual circumstances of the convicted person. So the I idea that um, he was conscripted, he was adopted, conscripted at ignite might come into place. Actually, rule 145 of the rule of procedure and evidence specifically instruct um, the judges to take this into account. Um, circumstances falling short of group of posting grounds for exclusion of, of criminal responsibility, such as duress. But don't forget, in that decision from the ICC, they already said, well, it's not duress is not applicable. So when it comes to this appropriate sentence, what are we going to do? Are you going to send him for 50 years, like in prison, imprisonment? Or you're going to take some mitigating factors into play um, and sentence for 10 years. We are still looking at it. We are still looking at it. We are waiting for the sentencing uh, before we know what is going on. The other thing that the um, critical issue I imagine, which I told mentioned briefly or I did talk about, was the issue of spirituality and war crime. Like I said, this was an opportunity for the ICC to critically engage or methodically engage in the aspect, the impact. Of, uh, uh, of spirituality uh, 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 and war crime, when you are made to believe that whatever you are doing, even if you are committing innocent crime, um, is you are doing to please God, or so to say, or you are indoctrinated um, where your leader actually used a spiritual force um, to, uh, to, uh, to compel you to do commit innocent crime. And this, again, it's this kind of problem where the colonial encounter with African traditions and uh, concepts and norms do pass, even not even in Africa, also in indigenous community in different parts of the world, including Canada, where we cannot understand um, the analytical framework where people engage their environment and, and make decisions. But if you use, use the Western lens or viewpoint, we assume that they are not rational, but they, are, or, or, but they could be rational to them uh, uh, because that is what they grew up around, that's what they believe in, that's their belief system, and that is how they see their world. That doesn't mean that it will absorb you from international crimes or from uh, accountability process, but it's a factor that should be considered in engaging with whether you willingly or you were coerced into doing that based on that spiritual framework. But the, um, IC, the ICC didn't engage with this and just Issues aside, and again, that's also the issue when we talk about colonialism, bringing it to colonialism, when we talk about the concept of witchcraft uh, and the colonial encounter, those colonial powers who don't understand um, voodoo, the role of voodoo, or the role of witchcraft plays uh, in people's uh, life and how they resonate with them. So that is also a missed opportunity by the ICC to critically and engage as a lived spirituality, as a lived reality, as a lived um, lifestyle. Or, or, or lived experience rather of traumatized soldiers, or even not even traumatized soldiers, but people that believe in those spiritual cosmology or so on and so forth. And then the other thing that I could get from that within the decision um, is the issue of what actually stand of the status of traumatized soldiers. Really, the decision you can just hear this. Once you are 18 and above, you are held accountable. Rightly so, but you can't just brush that on that on the, the years when you are not mature, it's 9, 10, 11, 12, you are not mature and just brush it aside and say it doesn't matter. It does matter. And even in the domestic criminal, uh, criminal, um, criminal system, that's why we have a different tier of different ways of prosecuting children that committed crimes while they were uh, under 18. Yes, the international law says on that thing, they're going to absorb you, they're not going to prosecute you. But it's as simple as that. And I think it's, it's, it's also a missed opportunity for the International Criminal Court, at least the Patriarch Chambers, to 
fully engaged or head on with this issue of performance uh, associated that committed crimes on the um, um, on um, the committed crimes why they were under 18 and also why they were over 18 because they were locked up in captivity. And you know, when the ICC was talking about that it had the you know it could have escaped. But that wasn't the testimony before everybody. Yes, it could have escaped. Everybody could escape and a captivity. But when you see people that are escaping and are being caught and being killed in front of you, it becomes very difficult for you to take that risk, except if you don't just assume I don't care, I want to die. So that is also a, a, a that's an aspect that the court did not um, engage with. And like I said at my introduction, during my introduction, the point is that we, as international legal scholars, international legal scholars focus more on the black and white, so simple, spiritual victim and the story not in between, but that's actually in between. And then, in and then the last thing I would say on this point is the fact that the court ignored enormous study, enormous data that has been over the years on this complex reality of traumatized soldiers, because they literally just adopted this strict legal um, legal um, analytical framework for it, and just did not look at the sociological um, research, the neuroscience research, um, the uh, the political science research, and different ways that have and that is not also not the right way to go. So let me conclude here and mention something um, that um, Dominic, like has been said by different authors, including myself in publication, um, he does represent uh, the complex status of thousands of child soldiers in different conflict zones. It's not only limited to Africa, in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, where they were forced to, they were possibly abducted, or uh, they willingly even joined arms in, in militia or insurgents group and eventually assumed from our position as many or thousands of them, and they eventually committed the same international crime uh, for which they were once uh, victims. One of the predicaments predict is thus that in it, it raised uh, this problematic and troubling question um, and does show in its own case that uh, victims, child, uh, who, former child soldiers, not even child soldiers, let's ignore the word former, child soldiers who actually engage in the victimization of others, despite the fact that their victim status is and should not be diminished by those acts. Because the female head that came out during the time that um, the decision was under one, oh, with um, the, the opinion it said, we reclaim the word victim from Dominic Owen and giving it rightfully to the other victims in Northern Uganda. And the question that came to me, uh, excuse me, Dominic still remains a victim. What I would like it, it might be an uncomfortable truth to say, but it's still a victim, and you can't say you reclaim that title from him. He is actually, and we, 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 we the international law, and it's, it is, it is, his perpetrator status should not um, diminish his, uh, you know, his victim own. But beyond that, the problem is that the moral and legal pressure uh, when a victim becomes the perpetrator, or when innocence transforms into, uh, 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 into culpability, um, is ambiguous and problematic. Um, the international law is saying the decision says 18. That's what the, the moment you call that 18, that you should be able to make the decision, rational thought, rational decision of leaving LA and say, I'm not going to join this rebellious group. It's, it's, not, it's not actually correct. It's not actually realistic. And this also underpinned under Dominic Owen's case is also, also this notion of reasonableness, um, uh, which has been the standard for assessing um, the baseline for human behavior. Or, but you can't judge determining reasonableness uh, in certain situations, especially in cases involving mental illness, which such as, such as Dominic Owen, who So Dominic case shows that even though the court refused to engage with it and refused to, um, refused to acknowledge it, but it's a critical and the court's failure actually shows that this is an understudied area um, and the law is not, international law is not yet how to meet it, you know, uh, how to define it, the issue of mental illness or, or how to define it, um, how to conceptualize it properly um, for the purpose of mitigation or occupation. But 
I'm still waiting for the decision of the uh, for the sentencing and see how the um, sentencing judge try to resume with this issue if possible. And that's uh, one of my other research projects at um, the U of T um, is to consider uh, the use of neuroscientific evidence, um, scientific findings in criminal procedures, uh, procedures rather, both at the local level, international and domestic level, and also at the international level uh, to determine the mental capacity of uh, legal actors, including uh, um, child soldiers. And my research, other research area is to see how this, understanding this phenomenon will actually change the conception of international justice for purposes. Clearly, Dominic Trad shows that uh, victimization, especially the victimization of child soldiers, um, is nearly a simple process um, with only this trait and it's easily recognizable victims of perpetrators is never done. And Dominic also tries to show um, that it should not, and it should not be treated, um, it's not, and it should not be treated as a case of one person, an exceptional situation is not. Um, it's a moral, it, 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 so, so, so it, this case reflects uh, the moral complexity which is involved with tax soldiers in different um, theaters of um, in different conflict theaters. And international law needs to engage with this, but like I said, the ICC judgment didn't really engage much with this. And we need to actually need that balances the political context of violence um, and also the failure of the state. It's the failure of the state to protect its citizens, including um, young ones. Um, alongside we're looking at the role those young ones plays uh, in the com community, uh, committing rather um, this criminal act uh, in order for us to be able to appropriately um, um, consider the question of whether they are responsible, their ejected role, and also whether uh, they are accountable for international crime. Um, I know my time is up here. I will open this one to question and answer. Thanks, Thanks everyone. I owe, thank you very much. That was, uh, <laughs> you covered a lot of ground in that one. And that is a story. Um, we, <laughs> we <coughs> excuse me, um, we do have some questions and I'm gonna give people a moment just to get uh, some of their own questions together and so forth. <coughs> I'm gonna ask the, uh, the, I think the obvious one that you teased at a little bit towards the end of the presentation. I know you're eager to hear what the, what the sentence is going to be. What do you think it's going to be? What do you, what do you expect to happen? Um, so it's going to be very difficult to pinpoint what might happen, but most likely um, the court will actually look at its victim status and engage with him in the aspect of mitigating um, the sentence, uh, sentence, the potential years that we might receive. Uh, my opinion is that he has been in custody since 2015, that five years. Um, the, if you compare it to what happens in the domestic um, jurisdiction, um, it shouldn't be too long. Uh, but again, we never can say. Um, the ICC might decide that they want to use this to pass a message, a strong message out um, to child soldiers or former child soldiers that they're not going to play with um, kids and go, you know, go and kids' gloves um, with you when it comes to issue of holding you accountable. But again, mine is that he's a big thing, and that is experience from age nine to 30 should actually be considered um, seriously engaged with and um, they should be a mitigating factor um, in the length of years that you will receive um, as you know for his crime. Uh, so that's actually really interesting and leads to two of the questions that I have uh, of waiting for you in, in line here. Um, one of the questions is uh, given I'm not going to read it word for word, but given the sort of the focus on this, is there political pressure um, for a particular outcome, or what are the what are the role of sort of big P politics in in um, in putting pressure on courts and uh, and prosecutors and so forth to uh, to move on things like this? So, yeah, in terms of political pressure, like I was discussing with you before we came on live, live. Uh, the target for uh, this particular piece of uh, prosecution of Dominic Owen wasn't actually Dominic. Um, the target was just a phoning, and it was because of political expediency 
that uh, Dominic King, uh, he was the only one they could find. And Joseph Kony wasn't, he doesn't have that complex status of being a former Thai soldier because he wasn't a former Thai soldier when they started committing that in his crime. So, but they couldn't abduct, or they couldn't not abduct, they couldn't capture um, Joseph Kony to date. So the place of politics do come into place, um, and that's the politics that led to uh, Dominic being, um, he, he being tried. And like I said before, um, the special court of the first, uh, the special court for Sierra Leone also engaged with this issue, and they reached a different conclusion, which is I'm not going to prosecute. We are not going to prosecute um, former Thai soldiers, um, but in ICC they reached the opposing the decision and went around. And the last point I will make here, which is very interesting. Um, which people have all the attention to was that during the 30 year war in Northern Uganda, the forces of the Uganda government actually committed heinous crimes against IDP people. And um, it, what is going on? Why didn't the ICC uh, look at it? But again, it was a political arrangement. We need a case to kickstart our, uh, when we became, when the institution became ICC, then that case, the Uganda government said, okay, 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 here is one case you can start with, but don't look at me. And they actually refused to look at uh, the uh, the the actually committed by uh, by the Uganda government again, which is political negotiation and maneuvering that happens with international criminal justice, um, which is a new experience. And I think it depends. Let me wrap up a little bit with this idea, uh, which is the fact that the views around Dominic Owen in terms of the, the views on the street, in terms of the views back in northern Uganda, is highly divided, it's highly polarized. People, some want him convicted so that they can get the reparation that's promised to victims. Because if he's not convicted, the money that goes with it, uh, with the reparation, will not get to them. So that's an aspect. And some said, this is just a wide good change. The person you should be looking at is just as funny. So why are you going on this? So, but it is, it is the way it is. That's what I was saying here. Yeah. How and and how long has has uh, has Joseph Kony been evading capture at this point? It's um, well, if you look at it from the domestic um, aspect since 1987, um, <laughs> if you look at it from the international aspect, we say since 2012, 2015, when the bond team was placed on him, but he has been elusive. We have um, um, there's evidence that he actually lived in South Sudan, but locating him and pinpointing him has been very difficult. That I think. And most international actors have almost given up. We never can see. All right. Um, so this is an interesting one uh, that was asked in the middle of the presentation. I think it's interesting, a really good question. Um, you you paid uh, you pointed out that the threshold uh, for for I think for duress um, was that the the threat of death or or you know severe violence had to be imminent. Um, is what? How is imminence defined, and why is that the threshold? Given your concerns of the things that you raised about trauma experienced as a child and so forth. So thank, thanks for that question. And that question is a very good one. Um, the, again, if we look at it from the domestic aspect, which international law, domestic criminal jurisdiction, which international law has to more or less move it after. Um, do it has to be, uh, it can be a long period of time. Um, so that's why I, I agree, uh, in my own opinion, that the US argument was a far fresh, um, it was a push um, where um, it might be difficult for the defense to succeed in that area. It has to be a brief period of time. And when the charge chamber was countering the argument, the point was that, okay, you had jurors. But you still rape those people that were forced into um, the wife, the seven people that were made your wife, first wife, and you continue to rape them for years. And some of them give back to you. So, are you telling that you're under duress for the whole time that you committed um, that atrocity um, and you had them under captivity? So, that is, but again, the defense has to fly with that. But the issue of trauma is actually a very uh, important piece of the trial that the defense try to engage with and that trauma could be long and enduring and most mental health most mental defense could be traced um, to trauma uh, to the impact of trauma of expressing traumatic events that make someone to become robotic uh, but unfortunately uh, in this case 
that wasn't engaging. They just believed that um, he had this rational uh, thought to make independent decision um, from um, from Joseph Kony. He, he has he did make them, um, and therefore um, there's no place come out place. But it is there is, and that was not well investigated. Um, and the data submitted, um, data collected by neuroscientists um, in domestic jurisdiction was not closely looked at. Um, that trauma is an ongoing change. So that is also a failure uh, of, um, of the International Criminal Justice Project um, in looking at trauma and especially for kids that are immature by the time they were captured and you know they were still in their formative age. And um, like I said, um, there's, a, there's something I, I remember there's this science that says that the frontal lobe of someone develop when you are fully developed when you are 25. Mm. So and this is someone that was still at nine and exposed to that kind of you know that traumatic event event. So yes, that's what I would say. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question. And I, I, I have a feeling it's going to invite a scathing indictment of the ICC, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Um, so uh, someone has said they, they teach uh, the grade 12 course, which actually does have some room for international law in it. It's one of the things that's actually notoriously difficult to teach because, you know, international law, there's, there's not a lot of case, so there's not a lot of jurisprudence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, but I noticed this as well, early in the presentation, you sort of referred to it as the court of last resort, um, which is there. Uh, you know, uh, if, uh, if, a, if a country is uh, not willing or not able. Why in the world would, so this is the question, uh, give the, the question is, we've taught our students that the International Criminal Court is kind of hobbled by the fact that it really has no jurisdiction and no teeth and things like that. Why would they be more able to successfully prosecute or, or you know, than a domestic court would? Why, does it, why are they a last resort? Thanks, uh, thanks for that um, question. And um, for me to so, so for me to go back um, and quickly provide some answers there, we have to go back to the origin of international uh, criminal accountability and the intervening years. Um, and when we trace the origin, uh, we look at it from the Nuremberg trial and um, the Tokyo trial in 1948 after the World War II. And uh, when the winning the Allied powers um, made a political arrangement. Um, to prosecute um, um, the losing party. So it was called a victor's justice, and international criminal um, justice has been framed from that aspect where some people that won the war were holding that country, most people that lost the war. So, but again, that was a special moment in international criminal justice in 1948. Mm -hmm. But after that, there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a pause due to Cold War and also and so forth. Then, if you look at it, uh, to that time, there's so many innocent. Crimes that were committed in Uganda, Pinochet in Cambodia, um, and different um, in Rwanda, that is very innocent, which we know, or the massacre of the Serbs in the former Yugoslavia. And that led to where the international actors um, feel that we need a permanent court because it shows that political figures that commit innocent crimes against their uh, citizens might not decide, might not want to hold themselves accountable. Again, you don't expect a leader that, uh, like a I mean, from in Uganda that killed a lot of people, and I said, I want to constitute a court to hold myself accountable. But when they were negotiating that from started um, in 1998 or thereabout, one of the things they did was that there could be in some instances where countries are able to actually or they demonstrate uh, the capacity to hold accountable people that committed innocent crime. Say, for instance, there's a regime change. So the person, there's an overthrow, the last president has gone, that committed innocent crime, and then um, the new president wants to hold them accountable. They can do that. And if you look, I think it's in Kenya, or is it in Canada, Uganda, or Kenya, they actually have in their domestic court uh, system an international crime um, division that stood international crime. So that is that. But the reality is the fact that most countries will not want to hold themselves accountable. Most leaders, most leaders will not want to hold themselves accountable. And that's why ISIS needs to um, step in. But again, ISIS is also limited. It's not, um, it says um, international permanent, international criminal court, but its reach is not everywhere. And then the issue of political consideration comes into play. Yeah, for instance, Syria. Syria has been, uh, uh, is the most dangerous place to live in the whole world for the last 10 years has been in battle, but the Security Council refused 
um, to refer that case to ICC, to a jurisdiction, and ICC does not have jurisdiction because of that. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is that we need to look at the fact that even when I mentioned 124 countries um, as ratified the Rome Statute, we see fine, China didn't, US didn't, India didn't, and that means a large sector of the world is not involved in that ICC project. But the point to circle back to your question, the point remains that the expectation is local, local domestic courts should be the first one. Maybe you could look at it from the aspect of resource constraint um, sure. before it comes to ICC. But the reality is, nah, it's not going to happen. Actually, you see the same regime. There is a power that committed the atrocity. Is say the one in power. Yeah. That's a, that was a good answer. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, mindful of time and so forth. So I think we're gonna call it there. We do have, uh, we did have a question um, about whether or not we were gonna make the presentation available uh, to, to watch on the website, which we will do. Um, I am also aware that we've, uh, in, uh, I owe you didn't know this, but we had some sound issues um, cool. through, uh, through uh, at some point. So we'll try to do something and uh, maybe put a transcript as well for some of the parts that cut out and so forth. But uh, I just want to, your last comment there was wonderful to remind us that things like, you know, history and geography and law and, uh, and all of these things are actually all just sort of part of the same systems, you know. Um, and, uh, and so that was wonderful. Um, I'm so happy to have had you here today to talk about this. I know that uh, in the grade 12 course where people are, are uh, really looking for interesting material to engage with. This is going to be wonderful and uh, and something that they can teach about and maybe go all the way back through to uh, to Coney and his uh, you know and his in his rise and stuff like that. So I just say thank you very much again. We have lots of people um, in the chat who are saying thanks for a, an interesting talk and stuff, and um, that's just super. So we'll ask you to hang on uh, for a moment. Um, everyone else is going to uh, make their way out. Um, and uh, Christy, we don't have a date for the next one at this point, do we? But uh, folks yet. who are following along, just uh, please keep an eye on us on Twitter and on the website, because we do have at least more, uh, one more of these webinars happening um, before June. Uh, so uh, stay with us and we'll let you know about the last one and we'll give a virtual round of applause and thanks for uh, Dr. Ayo Akinroye and his, uh, and his, his great talk today. Um, thanks very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for the privilege of the team. Thank you so much.